to Ephesians 4, verse 17. So that is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. And uh, you can hold your spot there. We're going to be going there in a couple of minutes. Paul is uh, writing this letter to believers who are in Ephesus. We uh, see that in chapter 1, verse 1, Paul said to the saints who are in Ephesus, he is, we see that he is writing this to believers. And down in verse 13 of the same chapter, Paul said, In him you also, when you heard the word of, word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So they heard the gospel, they believed on Christ, and they were sealed with the Holy Spirit. And the sealing of the Spirit takes place the moment of our conversion. The moment we heard the gospel and believed in Christ, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit takes up residence within the believer, and God wants to conform us into the image of His Son. He wants us to be more and more like Him, and it's uh, kind of like when someone moves into a home that needs a lot of work. Walls get torn down, floors get ripped up, but by the end of the renovations, the host is completely changed and transformed. And uh, that is what God wants to do with each one of us. He wants us, he wants to change us from the inside out. And it's a bit of a painful process because God will cut away anything that is hindering our growth in Christ. And ultimately, God wants to look down on us and see the image of his son. In Romans 8 verse 29, Paul said, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, listen to this, to be conformed to the image of his Son. He wants us to be more and more like him. And after we are converted, there is a walk. It's kind of like when people get married. They say their vows to one another. They, before people and before God, there's the horizontal aspect of saying their vows before the people, but then there's also the vertical aspect of saying their vows before God. And what a lot of people forget about is for better or for worse. A lot of people forget about that second part. But you know, when trials or difficulties come, they walk away. And you know, it's like that with professing Christians, they make a commitment to Christ, and yet with time, they fall away or they walk away. In John 6, verse 66, we read after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. They walked away. And I'm assuming that the majority of us even know people who made commitments to Christ at some point in their lives, and yet with time, they walked away. They don't have a desire to read God's Word. They don't have a desire to pray or to have fellowship with God's people. And yet you hear people say things like, well, they need to come back to the Lord. They need to come back to the Lord. No, they need to be saved. They are still dead in their trespasses and sins. In 1 John 2, verse 19, John said, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went, oh, that it might become plain that they all are not of us. When John saw departure in his day, he didn't say they need to come back to the Lord. He said they went out from us, but they were not of us. And when people walk away from the faith, it's a sign that they were never, ever truly converted. And in Jeremiah 32, verse 20, we read these words, I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never stop doing good to them, and I will inspire them to fear me, listen to this, so that they will never turn away from me. So that they will never turn away from me. And yet how many times, I don't know about you, but I know, you know, hear people say, you know, they, they need to come back to the Lord. No, they need to get saved. A truly converted person will never abandon Christ. And you know, as the old saying goes, talk is cheap. For Christians, there's a walk that is to be lived out. Just recently, there were uh, six professions of faith out in Marguerite. And I was talking with two actually last Wednesday, and he told me from what he remembered, that was uh, one of the best meetings that they had 
from what he could remember out in Murray Green. And I mean, that's exciting. They had five days of gospel meetings, and uh, six people ended up making professions of faith. That's exciting. But there is a walk that is to be lived out. And that's what Paul focuses on in this passage that we have before us in Ephesians 4. He focuses on our walk with Christ. If you look down in verse 1 of chapter 4, Paul said, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. In verse 17, he said, you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. In chapter 5 of verse 2, he said, and walk in love. Verse 8, walk as children of light. Verse 15, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Clearly, he is talking about their walk with Christ. And as I mentioned earlier, he is writing this to believers who were sealed with the Spirit. If I had to uh, put a title on today's message, I would title it, Living Out Our New Identity in Christ. Living Out Our New Identity in Christ. So we will start in verse 17. The New Life. Now this I say in testifying the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ. Assuming that you have heard about Him and were taught in Him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal. But rather let him labor. Doing honest work with his own hands. So that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. But only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. When someone receives a new set of clothes, they receive a new identity. Think of a police officer or a firefighter, somebody, or, or say a soldier in the military. They, they put on their uniform and they are expected to live differently as a result. By putting on their uniform, they are taking up new responsibilities that resemble their new identity. And you know, it's the same for Christians. When we were converted, we received a new set of clothes. We put on Christ. We were clothed with His righteousness. And we are called to live differently as a result. You will notice that Paul is using a clothing metaphor in this passage that we have before us. In verse 22, Paul said, put off your old self. In verse 24, Paul said, put on the new self. So there is the putting off and there is the putting on. We do this with our clothes on a daily basis. We put off our dirty clothes and we put on clean ones. 
Well, we need to do that spiritually. We need to put off anything that will hinder our growth in Christ and put on our new self. We need to live out our new identity in Christ. And uh, Paul used this clothing metaphor before. For example, he told the Colossians, you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. And uh, we looked at that passage before as a church. To the Romans, Paul said, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. In verse 14 of the same chapter, he said, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He told the Galatians, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So we see that Paul used this type of language before. And this passage from Ephesians is dealing with our sanctification. Once we become Christians, we will be in the process known is sanctification where we are becoming more and more like Christ. Once someone is justified, once someone is made right with God, they will be in the process of being sanctified. And the process of sanctification includes two main components. There's the negative aspect of it, which is forsaking sin, and then there's the positive, which involves pursuing holiness. And in 2 Timothy 2, verse 22, we see both of these components. Paul said, so flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness. Just like a battery has a positive and a negative, it is the same thing with the process of our sanctification. We need to flee from sin and we need to pursue godliness. And Paul encourages his readers in both of these areas. And he does so by using a clothing metaphor. The putting off and the putting on. And so this passage is dealing with our new identity in Christ and how we are to live in light of it. Verse 17. We see that we are not to live like unbelievers. We are not to live like unbelievers. Verse 17. Now this I say and testify the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Paul wants his readers to abandon their former lifestyles. You must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. You know, when we become Christians, we are called to live differently from the rest of the world. And yet there are professing Christians who look like the world, act like the world, dress like the world. And they are living worldly lifestyles. We are called to live differently. We are called to be set apart. And you know, we are not to be like the Israelites in the wilderness who look back on Egypt and thought to themselves, oh, oh, those were the good old days. Those were not the good old days. That's when they were in bondage. That's when they were in slavery. And yet professing Christians can do the same thing. They can look back on their old life and be tempted to go back. They are tempted to live like their old self. We must not live like unbelievers. People without Christ are living lives that are empty and without meaning. They are, ultimately, they are living for themselves. We must put off our old self with its practices. We must not live like pagans. As I'm sure we all heard the saying, we are to be in the world but not of the world. We are to live differently from those around us. You shall be holy, for I am holy. We must not live for self. You must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. In other words, don't live how you used to. You need to put off your old self with its practices. And you know, when we come to Christ, we leave our old life behind. We hand over the master key of our lives to Christ. We fall under His authority. We are not to live like unbelievers. Now that doesn't mean that we're never going to sin, or that we're not going to struggle with sin. Let me put it this way, I used this illustration last Wednesday at prayer meeting, but think of a kid. You know, it, it rolls around in the mud. That, that's its nature. If someone magically transformed that pig into a person, it would have a new nature. 
It could still go to the mud and get dirty, but it would be embarrassing. He would be ashamed because it would go against his new nature. Well, it's like that with the true Christian. We can still fall into sin, but it brings shame, misery, and embarrassment because we know we, we, it goes against our new nature. And we know it brings shame on Christ. We will struggle with sin, but we are not to live like our old selves. You must put off your old self with its practices. And my friends, if there's anything that is hindering our growth in Christ, we need to cast it aside here this morning. Paul said, put off your old self. He didn't say put on your old self. He said, put off your old self. Have you put off your old self with its practices? You must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. And then verse 18, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God. Unbelievers are alienated from the life of God. Their sins are, are separating them from Him. They are still dead in their trespasses and sins. And that was their condition before Christ. They are darkened in their understanding. Spiritually, they are blind. The natural man does not accept or understand the things of God. They are foolishness to Him. They are ignorant of God's truth. In Romans 1 and verse 21, Paul said, For although they knew God, not in a saving sense, that is, they knew about His attributes, although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. You see, they had this general revelation about God, they could look at creation and know that there's a creator just like we can look at a building and know there's a building. You know, you don't look at a building and say, oh, this, this was here by chance. No, we know it had a building. I know well, my dad, when he was younger, he was Omar, and this was before he was a Christian, but he was laying down one day and he was looking at the stars and he just knew, you know, that, that he's not here by chance. Creation points us to the creator. Well, they had this general revelation about God, but instead of turning to Him, they turned away from Him. They became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And we see in Ephesians 4, verse 18, that their hearts were hard. We can harden our hearts. Think of Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. Yes, we know that God hardened his heart. We also know that he hardened his own heart. We see that in Exodus 8, verse 32. But Pharaoh hardened his heart. That's scary, isn't it? We can harden our heart. We, we can hear the gospel time and time again, and, and, and yet re, re, refuse to repent and believe the good news. And, and we can harden our heart. In the book of Hebrews, there are several warnings throughout the book of Hebrews. Uh, the first is in chapter 2 about neglecting such a great salvation. But when you go to chapter 3, you know what the warning's about? It's a warning about hardening your heart. In verse 15 in chapter 3, the author of Hebrews says, As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion. We can harden our heart. When Ephesians 4, these unbelieving Gentiles' hearts were hardened to the point where they became callous. Verse 19, Paul said, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. When someone does something that is wrong, you know, their conscience accuses them. They know they crossed the line. They feel guilty about what they've done. But they keep doing it. They continue on in their sin. And you know what happens? They dull their conscience. And it would be like taking the batteries out of a smoke alarm. When a fire comes, there's nothing there to warn them. The unbelieving Gentiles' hearts were hardened to the point where they became callous. Morally, they were insensitive to sin. A true believer is sensitive to sin. 
Their hearts were reckless. They continued on in their sin and they continued to turn away from God. They became apathetic towards spiritual things. They didn't care and they practiced every kind of impurity. In Romans 1, three times it says God gave them over. God gave them over. God gave them over. In verse 24, 26, and 28. Well, you know what we see here in Ephesians? They gave themselves over. They gave themselves over. To what? Every kind of impurity. And my friends, there's people like that today. They have given themselves over to every kind of impurity. They abandoned God's design for sexuality. And in Galatians, impurity is under the rotten fruits of the flesh. And Paul is saying you are not to walk the way they walk. You must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Another translation says you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. When you come to Christ, you need to leave your old life behind. You need to put off your old self with its practices. Do not live like unbelievers. Do not live like your old self. Live as a new creation in Christ. Live as a new creation in Christ. You know, many in the Ephesian church would have matched that description of the unbelieving Gentiles before they were converted. But then they became new creations in Christ and all things became new. You know, I think of the church in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 to 11, Paul said, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Listen to this. And such were some of you. Paul is saying that's what you used to be like, but then he goes on to say, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Like many in the Ephesian church, they had dark past, but they ended up having their lives changed and transformed by Jesus Christ. They got saved and all things became new. And I want to let you know here this morning that regardless of your past, God can change and transform you by His grace. We are all sinners. And we are all in need of God's forgiveness. And when someone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. You know, when I was younger, my sisters watched a, a, a show on TV. I can't remember what it was called. But uh, it was about a person who had a makeover. She went in and there was a whole team that worked on her. They did up her hair and put on a, a bunch of makeup on her. And by the end of it, she looked like a brand new person. At the end of the show, she walked out and her family and friends were there waiting for her. And they were shocked. She looked like a whole new person. For some on the show, they started to cry. All they could talk about was how beautiful she looked. Have you received a spiritual makeover? Where God has made you a new creation in Christ, where people around you, like your friends and family, look at you and see the transformation. They see that you've been changed from the inside out. They see your passion and your love for Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Have you received a spiritual makeover? Well, many in the Ephesian church received a spiritual makeover. They were changed and transformed by Christ. And God is still changing and transforming lives today. You must put off your old self with its practices and put on the new self. We are to live out our new identity in Christ. And if we want to live out our new identity in Christ, it will involve replacing sinful habits with healthy habits. Replacing sinful habits with healthy habits. 
There are four things to take off, and there are four things to put on that I want to talk about here this morning. Look at what it says in verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one speak... Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So we see here that we need to put off lying, which is falsehood. And uh, that obviously violates the ninth commandment. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And can you imagine the damage that that would do in a court of law? You know, a fair trial depends on the truthfulness of its witnesses. So if someone lies in a court of law, you can see the severity of that. Somebody could go to prison for the rest of their life and be wrongly accused. And you know, God hates lying. In uh, Proverbs 6, it talks about six things that God hates. Seven that are an abomination to Him, and one of those is a lying tongue. And yet a lot of people downplay lying. Oh, well, it's, it's not that big of a deal, they say. You know, when I... Ask people to share the Christian message with them. I usually ask if they think they, they're a good person. And the majority of people say yes. And then I usually say, you know, have you ever told a lie before? And people will say yes, but they, they downplay it. Oh, well, everyone does. It's not that big of a deal. God does not take lying lightly. In Revelation 21.8, we read, All liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And if someone told one lie, they're just as guilty as someone who broke every single one of God's commands. And as I said earlier, we all need God's forgiveness. But when people lie, it, it gets to the point where you can't believe anything they say. You know, one of my uh, friends in particular, when he was younger, he would, he would lie all the time about how much weight he could lift at the gym. He would tell somebody, oh, I can bench press 300 pounds. And then he would tell someone else, I can bench press 315. And someone else, oh, 290 pounds. Well, we all went to the same gym. So we talked with one another, and it became obvious that he wasn't telling the truth. He wasn't being truthful. Or you would see him on the bench press, and you would say, there's no way that guy can bench 300 pounds. And I remember uh, confronting him on it, uh, uh, about that. And he admitted to me that he lied. And uh, he, he, he kept doing it, and it got to the point where he couldn't trust him about anything he said. And it's like that with people who lie. You, you can't trust anything they say. But you know what happened? Instead of lying, you know what he started doing? He started telling me the truth. He started telling me, so he replaced lying with truth telling. And he started being honest about how much weight he could lift, and eventually he built up the trust. So now if he tells me that he bent across 300 pounds, I believe him. But he replaced lying with truth telling. He's not a Christian, but you know, we see in this passage that we are to put off lying. And we are to put on truth telling. You know, when we lie, who are we imitating? The devil. The devil is known as the father of lies. Right? And when we tell the truth, who are we imitating? God. God is truth. Jesus said, I'm the way and the truth. And in the book of Hebrews, it tells us that it is impossible for God to lie. So when we tell the truth, we are imitating God. When we lie, we are imitating the devil. We need to put off lying and we need to put on truth telling. Look at what it says in verse 26. Therefore, having put away falsehood, that would be lying, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. Substitute lying with truth telling. In verse 26 and 27, Paul went on to say, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. If someone is harboring anger within their heart, there's anger bottled up inside of them. They can give the devil a foothold. Which means, I look this word up, it means a place, or a seat, or an opportunity. If you're holding on to anger, or you're bitter towards someone, the devil will want to exploit that. You know, if you have a fire of, of anger that is going on inside of you, you know what the devil will want to do? He'll want to come by with a, 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 a can of gasoline, and he'll want to just pour it all over 
You know, what would happen if you poured gas all over a fire? It, it would go all over the place. And that's what Satan wants to do with your anger, with my anger. He wants to take full advantage of it. Calvin said, I have no doubt that Paul was warning us to beware lest Satan should take possession of our minds like an enemy-occupied fortress and do whatever he pleases, end of quote. Are you angry with someone? If so, think about ways to resolve it. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Don't go to bed angry. You need to substitute anger for righteous anger. A righteous anger would be a holy hatred. You see this with David. For example, in Psalm 119 and verse 53, David said, Burning indignation has ceased me because of the wicked who abandoned your law. Jesus also expressed righteous anger. We know that when he flipped the tables in the temple. And in Mark 3, verse 5, it says, After looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. Jesus showed an anger that was mixed with grief. And we too should be grieved and angered over sin. We should love the things that God loves and hate the things that God hates. We should put on anger and put on righteous anger. So substitute anger for righteous anger. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Don't give Satan a foothold. In verse 28, Paul goes on to say, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Stealing violates what commandment? The, the Eighth Commandment, right? You shall not steal. And I've talked with people again who try to downplay stealing. Well, it was just candy when I was a kid. Well, value is irrelevant. You know, if somebody took a dollar out of my pocket, a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, or stole my vehicle, it would still make that person a thief. And according to 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 to 11, thieves will not inherit the kingdom of God. Stealing is a sin. And as I said earlier, we all need God's forgiveness, of course. Stealing was a problem in Paul's day, and it's a problem today. You know, I, uh, I actually know someone who recently had their vehicle stolen. Paul said, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work. We must put off stealing, and we must put on honest work. We were created to work. And work is actually a gift from God. Work was not a result of the fall. Jesus was a carpenter. He knew what it was like to, to work. Paul was a tent maker. And in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10, Paul said, If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. If we want food, we should work. And Paul also tells us in verse 28 of chapter 4 that we should share with anyone in need. I came across this quote by John Wesley. I like what it said. Work as hard as you can, make as much as you can, then give as much as you can. End of quote. I remember my dad used to always tell me there's givers and takers in life. Which one are you? Which one am I? Before Zacchaeus' conversion, you know what he was? He was a taker. He was a cheap tax collector. He'd rip people off, take their money. And then he was converted and he became a giver. In Luke 19, and verse 8, we read, And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. It's a beautiful story of God's grace. He was a taker. He became a giver. We should substitute stealing with honest work. Look at what it says in verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear we must put off corrupting talk. Jesus made it clear that we will give an account for every careless word we speak. Can you imagine if somebody had a video 
uh, or a tape recorder and recorded every single word that we ever spoke and played it back to us. Perhaps for some, we would be running for the doors. <laughs> we will give an account for every careless word we speak. Augustine actually had a sign that he hung in his living room, and you want to know what it said? Whoever speaks evil of an absent man or woman is not welcome at this table. End of quote. We can do a lot of damage with our words. My mom used to always tell me something that, uh, that her mother told her. If you don't have anything nice to say, then don't say it. But you know, we can use our words to build one another up, or we can use our words to tear one another down. And we can do a lot of damage with our words. No doubt no, we've all been hurt by words before and, 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 and hurt others with our words. In Proverbs 10, to verse 19, we read, When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. The NLT puts it like this, Too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. Before we speak, we should ask ourselves, Will this build someone up? Or will this tear them down? We are, we, we are to encourage one another. And there have been times where I've been discouraged and someone came up to me with an encouraging word and, and picked me up. You know, it would be like going over and helping someone up who's on the ground. You know, we can do a lot of good with our words. But at other times, it's the complete opposite, right? Where we are hurt by words that people say. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. And in chapter 5, verse 4, Paul said, Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead, let there be thanksgiving. You know, if we want to live out our new identity in Christ, we need to put off corrupt talk and put on edifying talk. Do you use your words to build one another up, or do you use your words to tear one another down? Do I use my words to build one another up, or do I use my words to tear one another down? Let's use our words to encourage one another. In Ephesians 4, verse 30, Paul said, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Do we see what Paul is saying here? We can grieve the Spirit when uncropping talk, when crop talk comes out of our mouths. When people gossip, they can grieve the Spirit. Paul says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. That is a command. We can also grieve the Spirit by the things that were, were mentioned. Lying, stealing, getting angry, or using unwholesome talk. When we slander someone or use abusive language, these are all things, my friends, that can grieve the Spirit. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is a person. So when we grieve the Spirit, we grieve God. We can cause pain and deep emotional sadness. Paul says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And yet how many of us have grieved the Holy Spirit okay. by something we said or something we did. And if someone has a speech problem, they have a heart problem. They're related, they're connected. Because what comes over the mouth is a reflection of what is in the heart. If you have a speech problem, you have a heart problem, and you must be born again. We need to put off corrupt talk and put on edifying talk. And in verse 31, we see other things that we are to put off. Paul says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. We hold on to things like bitterness. We will do more damage to ourselves than anyone else. People who hold on to things like bitterness have a resentful spirit. Put off bitterness and replace it with forgiveness. Verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. You know, if we are struggling to forgive someone, 
We should look to the cross and think about how much God has forgiven us. And, and we are to extend that forgiveness to others. Paul said, forgiving one another is God in Christ forgave you. Now think of Jesus on the cross. The first words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Stephen, when he was being stoned, Lord, he, 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 he was praying for their forgiveness. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. We need to put off bitterness and put on forgiveness. Is there anyone that you need to forgive? Is there anyone that I need to forgive? Put off bitterness and put on forgiveness. So we see that there are things that we need to put off. And we see that there are things that we need to put on. Just like we change our clothes on a daily basis. Oh, with the old and with the new. We need to do the same thing spiritually. We need to live out our new identity in Christ. Have you put off your old self with its practices? Are you clothed with the righteousness of Christ? Because perhaps you're here this morning and you have not put off your old self with its practices. And you are living for yourself. You need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when I took my jump horse when I was younger, I put on my parachute. And when I jumped out of a plane, all my trust, all my confidence was in my parachute. I wasn't going to jump out of the plane and start flapping my arms like a bird. <laughs> All my trust was in my parachute. And in the same way, we need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we will all step out into eternity. And if we leave this life without Christ, we will fall under God's judgment. We need to put all our trust, all our confidence in Christ. And in Him alone for our salvation. We have all sinned against God. We rebelled against God. And that God has made provision through His Son, Jesus Christ. We need to believe that Christ died on a cross for our sins. That He rose three days later. That He had a bodily resurrection. That He is alive and living. And we need to transfer our trust from ourselves to Christ. And put our faith in Him and in His death. Upon a cross for our sins. And God is rich in mercy. He will accept any repentant sinner. Who comes to him in faith. And if you are here this morning. And you do not know Christ. Respond here this morning. Repent of your sins. And believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Surrender your life over. To Christ here this morning. Hand over the master key. God does not give grace to the proud. He gives it to the humble. Are you willing here this morning to humble yourself before God? Many people are trying to live the Christian life, and yet they're trying to live it in their own power or in their own strength. We need to surrender our lives over to Christ. And that's when Christ will live the Christian life through us. Put off your old self with its practices and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father God, we uh, thank you so much for your word, Lord. We thank you so much for this practice, for this passage. Um, we know, Lord, that sanctification is two main components, the forsaking of sin and pursuing righteousness. And Father, I just pray that each of us would put off anything that will hinder our growth in Christ, and that we would put on our new self. That we would live out our new identity in Christ. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. And I just pray, Father, that the putting off and putting on, that we would do this on a daily basis. That, Father, that we would be spirit-filled. That we would not grieve the spirit. Think of what Paul said, do not grieve the spirit. Oh God, I pray that we would wholeheartedly live for you, that we would follow you, that we would be obedient to you. 
Father, I pray for anyone here this morning who is lost, who does not know you, who is cut off from the life of God, someone who is still dead in their trespasses and sins. I pray that this morning would be the day of salvation, that you would make them alive in Christ. Lord, we know that you are still changing and transforming people today by your grace. So, Father, I just pray that even here this morning, that you would save someone, that you would adopt them into your family, that they would be born again. In Christ's name, amen.